Welcome to this interview. Uh, you are Professor Hajit Bedwal from York University, Canada. You have published widely on the questions of colonialism, social work and racism. How would you define the profession of social work? Um, thank you, Barzu. It's very good to be here. Um, how to define the profession of social work? I think that's a very big question and depending on where you are in the world, people might define it differently um, because there's the professionalization of social work and then there's social work practice that's outside of the professional um, organization of the work. But if I were to <clears throat> define it for the sake of sort of this conversation and, and what some of the dominant discourses are, I would say that people think about social work and social workers as um, a profession that is deeply concerned with the well-being of communities, families, individuals. Um, and I think it's also a profession that, um, within the Canadian context, there is a strong belief that the social problems that communities experience are a result of the social conditions in our world. So there are many structural barriers that can get in the way of um, communities being able to fully participate um, in their lives and in society. And those barriers can exist across um, class, age, race, sexuality, gender, etc., etc. And there's, a, I think, a very significant focus on relations of power and privilege and how oppression operates in our world. So these are forms of violence, and I, I use that word purposely, that are deeply embedded in our systems and our institutions. So it is, in terms of its contemporary manifestation, the, the definition that I'm giving is more its contemporary uh, understanding, there, there is a movement towards paying attention to the structure. Whereas more traditional, some might argue conservative social work, uh, located problems within people. So you were the problem. There was something wrong with you that needed to be fixed. Um, and there was little attention to the social context. Now I would argue that this dichotomy between more conservative, traditional understandings of social work that kind of blame the individual versus more contemporary, critical understandings of social work, I think those tensions continue even today. And depending on where you're employed, and the kind of institution within which you're working as a social work, I think these tensions are always present. Because social work is an arm of the state, and the state regulates who we're going to quote unquote help, how we're going to help them, how help will be defined, um, how social problems will be categorized, defined, who qualifies for service, who doesn't. There's a, a saying that we have in Canada, which may be a saying elsewhere as well, I don't know, but we often talk about um, whether or not social workers are agents of social change or social control. And we often have discussions with our students about this. And the reality, in my view, is that you're never just one or the other. I think Social work as a profession dances and moves between these, I think, and I will argue, very historically uh, bound um, constructions of the profession. Are we here to rehabilitate the individual or are we here to fix society? Yeah. Mm -hmm. In this context, I would like to ask you, how would you define the relationship between colonialism and social work? Mm -hmm. So there is a direct relationship between colonialism 
and social work. Um, I think this is where the work of post-colonial scholars, critical race scholars, um, queer studies, feminist work, I mean all, all critical <coughs> scholarship, you know, critical work, activism, has um, really challenged the dominant story about the history of social work. Um, and again, I'm speaking from a Canadian context, but the dominant story about social work's history is that we were a very caring profession that came into existence during the Industrial Revolution, the turn of the century, modernity, and our role as early social workers were to help communities who were gravely affected by the advancement of industrial industrialism. And the early story, which is sometimes, and again, I'm being very, um, speaking very generally here, I think, um, there are many people who have done amazing work on complicating that story, but I just want to sort of bring attention to what the dominant narrative can be, is that um, we, were, we were there to support and help provide services, meet needs. The version that sometimes gets subjugated by that dominant story about helpfulness is that the early social workers were um, deeply implicated in the project of colonialism. So at the turn of the century in Canada, what we have to pay attention to is that Canada is a white settler society and it was colonized by white Europeans and as many critical race scholars have argued um, like Shreen Razak and others, is that white bodies, white populations, through colonial violence, literally came to embody or position themselves both materially and symbolically as the right full citizens of Canada. So colonialism and colonial violence was all designed to create Canada as a white nation. So social workers, early social workers, played a profound role in that project. So any communities or populations who were uh, seen as different or other um, were positioned as outside of humanity, outside of civility. And we've got the indigenous communities of Canada who to this day are fighting dispossession dispossession of the land, there is ongoing genocide that's happening in our nation, but through colonialism, and I'm talking about the early, early stages of colonialism, um, the early social workers played a big role in taking indigenous children away from their families, placing them in residential schools. Um, the early social workers who were viewed as charity workers, and these were upper class white women, uh, bourgeois women, uh, in the name of helping and charity, they also um, worked to assimilate new immigrants to the country so that they could behave and act um, more Canadian. So I think there was um, the YMCA at the turn of the century that literally taught immigrant women how to sew uh, Canadian clothes, cook Canadian food, speak English, um, all in the name of helping. So there were many different places where those early charity workers, um, early social workers, they had a hand in what many of us argue is actually regulating difference. So regulating populations that were deemed to be outside of civility. The uh, paradox here that um, many critical race scholars point to is the project of assimilation is one where you're expected, the white man's burden is to assimilate the other and bring them as close as possible to a dominant construction of what it means to be moral, 
and civil and humane. Um, so it's about how closely you can move populations in that direction. But, but the violence of colonialism, uh, ongoing racism, is that you can never quite be that as racialized people. So you will still always be other. So it's interesting, right? Like, I mean, we want to assimilate, we want you to fit in, but you'll never quite be that. You will never quite fit in. So the relationship between colonialism and social work is that these early social workers were deeply implicated in the violence done to anybody who was deemed to be different. And in terms, just one last point before, we, before the next question is, um, when we talk about nation states and making nations white and, and the role of the state, so even then the professionalization of social work later on, the members of the dominant group are position themselves as morally superior and they cannot know their superiority without the um, without difference. So those two positionalities actually rely on each other. So folks who are considered to be morally superior need someone who is constructed as degenerate and other in order to define themselves as morally superior. I would say that that's still going on in social work today, because as social workers we are positioned as the experts, the ones who know how to fix and help the other, whether that's, you know, someone who's trying to um, stop using substances or someone who's trying to, you know, whatever the issue may be, we're still trying to raise them to a particular bar of acceptance which are norms in our world in order to be able to be seen as you know, worthy in society. So in contemporary social work, we were still doing the same thing. And so these are colonial continuities from you know, then to now that continue to repeat. Yeah. Yeah. And this leads us to the end. Yeah. The question about how racism is manifested within social work Maybe more on contemporary uh, yeah. Con uh, societies. Yeah. I think racism is foundational to social work. I think race and race logics and um, how difference was defined, how superiority was defined, it is foundational mm -hmm. to social work. In the contemporary, I mean, there are many ways that racism is manifesting. There's racism towards communities that we're working with. In Canada, social work remains a very white dominant profession. And that means it's mostly still white people that occupy positions of power in social work. So they're on the board of governors and institutions. They are the managers. They are the team leaders. Um, I teach in Toronto, Canada, which is an incredibly diverse city, and we have so many racialized students that are coming through um, our program. But what's interesting is that the um, organization of the institutions that social workers go out to work within are still very white. So you have institutional racism. Then you have, you have racism that um, racialized communities and clients face when they seek services in these institutions that are very white normed, very white centered. So there are access, there are access um, to resources, there are barriers that are in place. Um, oftentimes, organizations will talk about cultural competency or cultural sensitivity as a practice. And there are many of us who do critical race work that really challenge the notion of cultural competency and cultural sensitivity because what does that actually do to dislodge white supremacy in institutions? It's really about how to understand the quote-unquote other, but in a very essentializing way that in fact reproduces more stereotypes about communities. Um, 
and it's another form of violence. Um, but there's also racism that's taking place in social work curriculum in the classroom. So in Canada, our education and social work is still centralizing the learning needs of white students. So it still becomes about how to work with the other. So again, you're seeing another colonial continuity from colonial times, is that it's still about how do I work with difference? How do I assimilate the other? How do I do this? So a lot of racialized students experience their social work education as missing their experiences as, as racialized people. And I want to now bring attention to the research that I did because it, it, it will hopefully help to clarify um, my answer. I was a social worker for many, many years in Toronto and I worked in lots of different settings from community activist work to um, you know, community um, organizing. Um, sort of the last many years of my work, I was in the area of anti-violence, um, intimate partner violence, sexual violence, and I did counseling work. So as, as a racialized woman, I experienced actually a lot of racism in my role as a social worker, both institutionally and also um, directly from clients. So from white clients. And many, many years ago, I had an incident with a white client that I was working with that was very volatile. It was in the middle of a, a counseling uh, encounter. And the client um, said many terrible racist things. And I realized that um, any sort of intervention that I sought out in that moment to either de-escalate what was happening or maybe support her to kind of look at uh, how her ideas are racist. It just nothing helped. It just made matters worse and worse and worse. So when I actually went to my team to talk about what had happened with this client, and this is where things get really interesting. Their responses as an institution were very problematic. So I was advised to um, pay attention to being client-centered, um, to draw out my empathy and my compassion for the client. Um, and to, I remember one person even said, maybe you should explore her childhood trauma. <laughs> because maybe there's, there's some childhood trauma that's attached to these ideas that she communicated. Um, the most problematic suggestion was, oh, well, we can just move her to another white worker, <laughs> to a white counselor. Um, and uh, the other interesting response was that, see, nobody denied that the client had behaved racistly. It's just that there wasn't really any support in terms of practice and ethics around, okay, what do I do when this person comes back? And people felt very badly for me. You know, it's like, how awful. And I felt a little bit like I was pitied and, you know, just like, oh, what do you need? Like there was this, almost like I was getting therapy for experiencing this racism. And I found that deeply problematic and because I wasn't looking for, you know, them to lick my wounds, so to speak, I was looking for a structural response <laughs> because these are ethical dilemmas in our work. And the other complexity about their response was Racism became a personal issue. The way they treated me was that it was personal to me. It was a private concern. As opposed to something that's embedded in the fabric of our society. Like these uh, encounters, if you will, I'll say in quotes. <laughs> or these incidences, if you were, I'll say in quotes. That they just happen sometimes. And, you know, how awful and, you know, no, these are a part of our everyday 
they are everywhere in the system, in our day-to-day -day interactions, in institutions, like racism is everywhere, all the time. So my project, my research, set out to interview other racialized social workers in Toronto to see, okay, are they having similar kinds of difficulties? And I was both surprised and not surprised to learn that this is a daily occurrence. So coming back to your question, how does racism show up in social work? My research brings attention to, I think, an area that hasn't been looked at very closely before is, what if you are the other and you are occupying a professional role that historically was never meant for you? Historically, you were, you were on the side of being the, a member of a population that was supposed to be quote-unquote helped or managed or regulated. But now you are occupying a position that historically was never meant for you. The dilemmas that arise because of this positionality is that you can never really be seen as truly professional or competent at your job. Um, social workers describe situations where white clients would would meet them in the waiting room and then say, I don't really want to work with this person. Is there another, is there another social worker that I could work with? Um, they describe situations in which white clients um, uttered terrible racial slurs during appointments, um, perpetuated many stereotypes. Um, one worker that I interviewed was physically assaulted by a client who had been uh, racially aggressive towards her for many weeks leading up to the physical assault and she described working in an institution where she didn't think she could actually go to her team or her manager to say this is what's happening because she worked in an organization where you don't discuss race. Um, other workers were fired from their jobs if they tried to bring up issues of race. So the point is is that these are not just one-off situations. These are happening every day, all the time, and racialized social workers have no institutional support around how to address it. In situations where they are given some attention to it, it's often treated like it's a personal injury as opposed to a structural phenomena that is hurting our lives on so many levels. So the paradox that came out of the data and the narratives that participants shared is because, and this comes back to your first question that you asked me, you know, how does social work define itself? Because social work, and I'm quoting Leslie Margolin's work here, because social work imagines itself as a site of justice and goodness. Um, it is very hard for social work to come to terms with or acknowledge that it is, it is still a very violent profession, doing horribly violent things to many communities. So for the social workers that I interviewed in my study, if they went to their managers to name race and racism, um, they were met with further violence. How could you call me or us or this institution racist? Like, we are on the side of goodness. <laughs> so it is an interesting paradox because when the social workers would name these forms of racism, um, those ideals or those values in social work that we cherish, like being client-centered, being empathic, being caring, um, those were the same discourses that managers would use to regulate the social worker and force them back into these ethical dilemmas with the clients they were working with. So in a sense, those values in social work collude with racism. They reproduce it 
So if they refuse to work with a client who's behaving racistly or they question the institutional racism or, or, or white supremacy that's operating within an institution, um, their competency is questioned as a professional. Uh, and that's very serious. So can they ever really ever fully occupy that position as social workers? Okay, and then we go to our final question. Yes. <laughs> uh, what are the potential uh, solutions to this racial inequities within social profession and organizations? Yeah. I, 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 um, I always find these, these questions very difficult to answer yeah. because I think there are um, many interventions that are needed and there are many um, ways that we can challenge the inherent whiteness and racism of the profession. But what I'll share with you is what I heard from the participants who I interviewed in my study is they want the racism that they're experiencing in their daily work to be believed, to be acknowledged, but they also want it to be taken seriously as an ethical dilemma. We talk a lot about ethics in social work in terms of our practice. So ethics between workers and clients. And what is the study of ethics? It's about reducing harm. Like how do we not do harm to others? And so ethics is, is very central to how we talk about practice in social work. And the argument that I make throughout my work is that these are not just one-off, oh, these are just bad apples, you know, a few bad clients behaving badly. No, these are very real, very serious ethical dilemmas. And we need to start in the classroom in terms of the kind of curriculum that we're teaching students so that students, racialized students, you know, students from all forms of quote unquote difference can see themselves reflected in the teaching is what do we do when these situations come up? And what do institutions need to do to respond? Right? Do they need more education? Do we need to uh, challenge how um, diversity and equity projects manifest in institutions? I think those projects remain problematic too in terms of how well they're uh, challenging white supremacy. Um, but that's another conversation <laughs> for another time. Um, so I think we need to work at an institutional level, but we also need to work within social work. And I think we need to acknowledge first and foremost that race and racism is actually foundational to the profession. And we have to go back to history. We have to go back to the history of colonialism to really explain why it is that way in the here and now. And we need to shift our pedagogy in the classroom so that we are centralizing these concerns. Um, they're integrated into all aspects of our curriculum, our programs. Um, it's not just a special cultural week or something that you get once in a while. So your question is a very big one. I wish I had all the answers <laughs> or a magic wand, but I think those are some places to start. And we need more people doing research and writing in this area. Um, there are many activists you know, on the ground that are doing incredible work to fight these systems and so we need to work closely with our with our communities as well um, to create I think more systemic change. Thank you very much for this. Thank interview. you. Thank you. <laughs>